Hey guys, we are back updating the Power Rankings for Survivor 44 following episode 8, and this was definitely a better episode. While the boot itself was pretty predictable, I still found it to be a pretty fun round, especially with it being the first actual merge round of the game where it's a normal round, but that's just the way that it is. But there are 10 players to talk about, and let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into the video. So starting off at number 10, we have the boot from this week, but here we have Brandon. And I felt like Brandon's time was pretty much up here, especially with all this hog against Raw 2. I felt like Brandon was pretty primed to be the first member taken out of this Raw 2 group once the flip was to happen. And I felt it had been set up over the last couple of episodes. I felt like Brandon himself was not really being propped up, and instead was more so narrating the experience of being on Raw 2. You have them from the last episode, like being pretty central in the vote against Matthew and in turn him talking about Ratu staying strong. And even in this episode, he again talks about how Ratu essentially had the numbers when they weren't being set up to do well here. So it just made sense for Brandon to be the boot here. And I think something really funny to know here is that despite Brandon coming in 10th place and despite him being the third vote out after the merge, he never survives a round without some sort of immunity where in the first round he was going to be the first boot until he played an idol on himself, which isn't great. He obviously never goes back to tribal during the pre-merge. At the merge, he's on the winning team, so it gets immunity there. The next round, he gets individual immunity despite his own team going to tribal, so he has immunity there. And then this past episode was literally the first time since the premiere where he was at a tribal where he could have been vulnerable and he just gets idled out of the game there, which is a pretty funny bookend that literally the first time he was at a tribal where he was vulnerable, he used an idol to save himself. And then now he goes back to tribal again, only to be idled out himself. He never survives a round without some sort of immunity, which I think is pretty funny there. But in terms of his position, I mean, it's honestly not that great for a lot of the game where, especially now knowing that the true majority on that group was Matthew, Kane, and Jamie, which was later subbed in by Carson, Brandon was pretty much in the minority. And had they gone back to tribal in the pre merge that he would have lost Lauren, his closest number there. Mind you, he would have been spared due to him being better at challenges, but still, he was in the minority for a lot of that pre merge. And then at the merge, like, it's not like he did anything that impressive. He pretty much just stuck by his tribe throughout a lot of it and then was eventually taken out himself once the other two tribes decided to flip against Ratu. So at the end of the day, I find it to be a pretty mediocre game. And also, it's just kind of funny that he never survives a round where he is vulnerable. So take that as you will. But for all those reasons that he's here at number 10. And with that, there are nine players left in the game to talk about. And as usual, I'll be ranking them based on how likely I think they are to win based on their edit and current game position. But at number nine, it is the same person I had at the bottom of last week. But here we have Jamie, who pretty much got nothing this episode. She was on Raw 2, who are presented as being like really confident that they were going to run the table. And I feel like Jamie is not really being propped up here by any means. Now, you could say that she could be sheltered here, given the fact that the Raw 2s were so confident. But really, based on Jamie's edit up to this point, she herself doesn't have a whole lot of self-awareness. So I kind of doubt that. But really, I feel like there was nothing in this episode to really prop Jamie up. She was already at the bottom. She's still at the bottom. So because of that, she is here at number nine. Now we're moving on to number eight. And we had the same person I had at this spot last week. But here we have Lauren. And again, Lauren's very similar to Jamie. Got pretty much no content in this episode. Was on the tribe that lost out on the vote. And doesn't really have much to really prop her up. And I will say that compared to Jamie, I could actually see her being the next boot given that she has her extra vote. I feel like people are going to want to flush at some point and I think it might be expiring soon anyway. So I think Lauren might be inclined to use it at some point, but really what's it going to do at this point? I feel like she herself is not really being propped up at this point. I don't really see how she wins based on her edit, which is why she is here at number eight. Now I'm moving on to number seven, and this person is continuing to slide in my power rankings week after week, and this was a particularly bad episode for them, but here we have Heidi, and this was a pretty bad episode for Heidi, and further cements that she's just no longer in winter contention. Granted, I had already declared that last episode, but I feel like this was just more of the same, where she literally gets a spike in content, where she is shown trying to loop in the Tikas on the plan to idle out Brandon. But this is sort of presented as a negative where we see Danny later find out that Heidi had told him about his idol 
in that he gets his confessional talking about how Heidi may have ruined the plan, that he may get idled out himself now, and it's just a whole big mess. And I feel like that was a pretty bad knock against Heidi's edit. Now, you could say that it's not as bad given that the plan still went through, and in general, she is just getting more content now than she was before, but I still feel like this was a mostly bad episode for Heidi, and the fact that she was presented pretty negatively here despite the plan going through, and despite it not seeming like it should have been presented that negatively, was enough to drop her all the way to number 7 here. Now I'm moving on to number 6, and this is a person that I have continued to be up and down on, and I had an idea of where this person might land, however I feel like now seeing this episode, I have a pretty good sense of them. But here we have Kane, and this was a very bad episode for Kane, where he gets a confessional talking about him working with the Raw Twos, which already is going against like the fact that he was ha having this relationship with Carson at one point, and he even gets a confessional saying that it's hard not to be cocky given their numbers advantage, but that's just what they are. And he even goes further in saying that if a Raw 2 doesn't win at this point, then they will have messed it up. And sure enough, a Raw 2 is taken out and they are officially flipped on. And I feel like this was pretty much the death sentence for Kane's edit here, where at this point, I don't really see him winning the game. However, the main thing that I have going for him is the fact that he has been getting a relatively consistent edit. And I still stand by his whole storyline of him wanting to be a hero. And it makes me think whether he could either be like a fallen angel or possibly even a losing finalist. Mind you, I did have that idea coming into last week. However, I felt like there were still like enough there to where maybe it could be translated into a win. But I feel like at this point, after seeing just how bad this episode was, I feel like I can't really justify having Kane in winter contention anymore. Mind you, I think he is more likely to be a losing finalist than even the number five person will be getting into, and again, even the number four person, but it's just the fact that they were undermining this episode when they really didn't need to was enough to have them here at number six. Now I'm moving on to number five, and realistically, I don't think this person is winning either. However, I feel like compared to the other people, he hasn't been as undermined, but here we have Danny, and it's sort of strange that I have Danny this high as... I feel like he has been undermined quite a bit in the pre-merge, and even now, like, he's not looking the best in the world, and I even debated putting him lower, as I had literally had him at number 8 the last, what, like, 3 or 4 weeks in a row now? However, I feel like the people we already talked about have bigger holes that were present in this last episode, where I feel like this was an actively worse episode for Heidi and Kane that just further cemented that they're not winning. Whereas I feel like with Danny, I feel like at this point he is being presented a bit more sympathetically than he was before. Now at the end of the day, I still don't think he's winning. However, I feel like this was a better episode for Danny than it was for a lot of other people. But at the end of the day, he's not really winning. So because of that, he is here number five. Now I'm moving on to number four. And despite this person moving up, I still don't think this person's winning at this point. But here we have Franny who again is the highest ranked member outside of Tika because realistically, I think a Tika member is winning at this point. But really, this episode was just not enough considering everything that had happened. Where for one, Franny had just lost, you know, like Matt, who was her closest ally and her showman. And she was even a target at this tribal where she does ultimately stay largely due to Danny's idol play. But there was a lot that Franny could have been involved with, but I feel like her content this episode was just very minimal, where she gets her confession at the beginning talking about like the fact that she lost Matt, which obviously you would expect, but then beyond that, she isn't shown acting upon that, and considering that this could have been the start of her storyline, sort of similar to what we saw with Natalie from San Juan del Sur, the fact that she doesn't get that uptick in content where she starts to play for her and Matt to get revenge on the people that took out Matt, particularly when they're raw to people, the very people that voted out Matt, is another pretty big knock. And even then, she was going to be the target until Danny played an idol on her. And the fact that she doesn't get more credit for getting Danny to want to do that and for them being pretty effective in this plan is such a big knock against her edit to where I just don't see the win at this point. Now, yes, I feel like compared to everyone else, I feel like she has fewer knocks in her edit, 
But I feel like Franny's edit has been one of missed opportunities where even though people are pretty high on her, I feel like there just isn't enough there to justify a win. She hasn't been getting a storyline that props her up on her own. And even now that we're seeing her in the game without Mad, she's just not getting enough to where I can have her any higher than here. At this point, with me thinking that a Tika member is going to win, I feel like that just leaves Franny out of all this. Now again, I feel like the fact that she has fewer knocks than the people we already mentioned was enough to have her as the highest ranked member outside of Tika, but really, I just don't see it right now, which is why she is here number four. Now we're moving on to number three, and just like last week, the top three are all Tika members. I feel very confident that a Tika member is going to win, and this episode didn't really change that. However, the order did change a bit from last week. But number three, and it kind of hurts to say this, but I do have to put Carolyn here. And I feel like Carolyn's edit has kind of been dying off in recent weeks where, yeah, she had a strong pre-merge and a strong like merge episode. And I even excused last week's episode for it being a relatively cool down episode for her, even though even then she was shown being wrong in the actual outcome of the vote. However, the fact that this was also a quieter episode for Carolyn, while Tika is being shown to be increasingly relevant in the game talks, is very worrying to me. And when you mix in the actual perception of Carolyn, I feel like it's not really improving, where despite you're saying over and over again that she's being underestimated, that no one's like listening to her, no one's taking her seriously, we haven't really seen that turn around up to this point, where even in this episode, people are still like saying that oh, Carolyn will just follow whatever Jam Jam's doing, and she isn't even being shown being looped in on what the Tikas are doing to where she's the only one to not vote with the other Tikas in the vote, where, yes, she does technically vote correctly in voting for Brandon, but that's not what the other Tika members were doing, and it's not really explained why that's exactly the case. Now, if I had to guess, I mean, there are certainly explanations for this, like, it's possible that the Tikas could be just voting differently in order to make people think that the Tikas aren't working together. But the fact that this isn't being propped up more on the show is not great. And I feel like with Carolyn like largely dying off in the post merge, it just makes me very concerned about our long term prospects where I think she's likely to get to the end of the game. However, I feel like with this like lack of shift in terms of her content, it makes me think like that she could just end up being a losing finalist by the end of it, where we have seen in recent seasons that like players that have strong pre-merges only to die off in the post-merge go on to be losing finalists. I think Mike Turner from 42 is a prime example of this. And it's very possible we could be seeing the same thing with Carolyn, where we're not so much seeing like her outright flaws as it's largely the same as what we saw before. It's just the fact that her overall visibility is dying off and we're not really seeing like those concerns of her being underestimated really be challenged or turned around. So I think it's for all those reasons that I'm actually starting to lean off of supporting Carolyn at this point, as I just feel like she's more likely to be a losing finalist at this point compared to the top two. Now, yes, things could maybe turn around, but if history serves, I think Carolyn is on track to be a losing finalist based on this edit. So it's for all those reasons that I did have to have her as the lowest ranked member of the Tikas, which is why she is here number three. Now we're moving on to number two, and it's another Tika member, but here we have Carson. And again, I still have the same concerns that I have with Carson before. However, I will admit that he is starting to creep up on me a little bit. I feel like he hasn't been as actively undermined as I would have expected from him. And we are seeing him like being a pretty central strategic force on Tika, where we're seeing him talking about like playing the middle and targeting Aratu while weighing out his options. Now, yes, he did have that content of getting sick early on, which I mean, take that as you will. But really, I just thought that was just set up for the challenge where him and Carolyn were just going to suck at the challenge more than anything else. So I don't think there's too much credence that can be put into that. But I still feel like compared to Carolyn, I have more faith in Carson to actually win if he gets to the end. And with Tika being pretty poised to run the game for this stretch of the game, I think Carson could get towards the end of the game. Now, at the end of the day, I still think he's probably going to be the biggest threat by the end of it. And I would probably have less faith in him to actually get towards the end without outright being cut compared to the number one person. But I think the fact that he hasn't been as undermined in the edit as I would have liked 
plus the fact that he does seem to be taken more seriously within the game compared to Carolyn was enough to have him at least as high on the list. But again, I feel like the number one person is probably being more set up to actually win at the end, which is why he is here number two. And now at number one, the person I believe is the most likely to win Survivor 44 right now is the same person I had at number one last week. But here we have Jam Jam. And again, I think Jam Jam is being set up the most to actually win, where this was a good episode for him, where he talks about getting through all the adversity and him being the cat with nine lies. He feels like the game is changing now that Tika is in the middle, which sure enough, they are. He gets plenty of narrational content talking about how Tika's playing the middle. And obviously he and along with Carson are being shown like, obviously like strategizing with the Sokas who eventually take out Brandon at the end of it. However, he also gets a good confessional later on the episode where he says that his goal is to get to the vote and have more options in the future, which I think was pretty exemplified by this actual decision here where he and Carson vote for Franny, even knowing that it was likely Franny would have an idol play on her. So technically they did vote incorrectly here. However, it does seem like they're doing this more so to placate the Sokas while not upsetting the Ratus too much as they know that this plan was going to obviously not cause Franny to be taken out, but at the same time, they want to actually still indicate that they're working with the Sokas by recognizing that the idol play would be going to affect there. So it was an interesting play of them to actually stay within the middle. And I think it probably will lead to them having more options in the future. And with Tika being the complex tribe, I think it's largely going to be effective. I think the Tikas are going to continue to maintain the strong position in the future. And unlike Carson, I think Jan Jan is being set up more to ultimately come out on the top here, where I still think Carson has that big worry of him just being this big character that's eventually going to be taken out. Whereas I feel like Jam Jam is going to rise above all that, whereas despite him seeming like he would be a big threat, and despite him actually being targeted, he's still being shown like talking about being an underdog, which I think is pretty fitting there. And I think through that, I think it's likely that will come up on the top by the end of it. So it's for all those reasons that I think Jan Jam is the most likely of these people to actually win, and I feel like he's being the most propped up in the edit to actually come out on top. So it's for all those reasons that I have him here number one. And there we go, that will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe, really helps out with the channel. And I'll be back again next week to update the power rankings again, so stay tuned for that. I am still covering Big Brother Canada 11 and doing weekly power rankings of that, so stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already, be sure to join my Discord server, which you can join by clicking the link in the description. There's a lot of stuff coming your way, but for now, that's the video. See ya.